Okay, at the, uh, the risk of scandalizing the midshipmen present, we're going to talk about justified coups. Okay, so be careful with this information that you gather today. Uh, to do that, uh, we, we're graced with uh, the presence of uh, Ozan Verrill, who's an associate professor at Lewis and Clark Law School, and his recent legal scholarship has focused on constitutional transitions and constitutional design. But most germane to our, our talk or our conversation today, he's the author of the, uh, the Democratic Coup d'etat, published at Oxford University Press uh, in 2017. His arguments in this book, predictably, were featured in various domestic and foreign media outlets, including Newsweek, Wall Street Journal, BBC, and CNN, The Washington Post, Slate, and Foreign Policy. Professor Verrill also serves as a legal consultant and expert witness on Turkish law to various private and government entities. Before academia, he served as law clerk of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And in a previous life, uh, he has a bachelor's degree from planet, on uh, planetary sciences uh, from Cornell University, where he was a member of the operations team for the 2003 Mars Exploration Rover's mission. So thank you for coming all the way from Portland, Oregon. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So the year is 1974, and this is Paulo de Carvalho. Um, he is Portugal's nominee for the annual Eurovision contest. Now, when I mention that contest before an American audience, I usually get blank stares. So I'll just give you a very brief background. The Eurovision, the Europeans are obsessed with this contest, by the way. When I was growing up in Turkey, we'd just be glued to the TV. But each country submits a song to participate, and then there's a contest every year, and other countries vote on, on the song. Um, so this has existed long before American Idol and The Voice since the, since the 1950s. Now, I don't speak Portuguese, but I'm told that the singer was singing about the end of a romantic relationship. Uh, the song performed abysmally in the Eurovision Song Contest, coming in 14th in a field of 17. Yet, the singer's deep disappointment must have turned into utter astonishment <coughs> when his love ballad served as a signal to launch a coup d'etat in the heart of Europe. Now, in the Western world, military coups are ordinarily relegated to the fantasy realm. We tend to assume that coups happen in backward, far, far away societies, in, in countries riddled with incompetence and corruption, and in nations that end with Stan. But on April 25, 1974, Western Europeans woke up to a coup d'etat in their own backyard. Well, at the time of the 1974 coup, Portugal was home to a brutal dictatorship called the Estado Novo, or the, the New State. The dictatorship had been around for more than 40 years, which gave it the, the dubious honor of being Western Europe's oldest dictatorship. It was a fairly typical authoritarian government. Um, opposition parties were outlawed. The regime kept dissent in check through a reviled, brutal political police. And during the, the dictatorship, Portugal was the most underdeveloped country in Western Europe, with many Portuguese living in abject poverty. On April 25th, 1974, hundreds of military officers decided to take action. And the signal to start the coup was that song uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk by Paulo de Carvalho. As the song began to hum across radios in Portugal, the officers moved into action, and army officers loyal to the regime were quick to put down their weapons after they realized that they were significantly outnumbered. The 40-year-old dictatorship collapsed with remarkable speed. And following the coup, thousands immediately flocked to the streets in celebration. They went to the Lisbon flower market, which is a central gathering point, and picked up carnations to place in the gun barrels of the soldiers as symbols of support. As a result, the April 25th coup came to be known as the Carnation Revolution. The military then oversaw a two-year pr transition process to democracy. So soon after the coup, political parties began to form. And about a year after the coup, there were about 50 political parties competing for power in the newly minted, newly created democratic public place. 
The military abolished censorship of the press, permitted freedom of expression, and following presidential and parliamentary elections in 1976, which is just two years after the coup happened, the leaders turned over power to democratically elected um, civilians. In addition to creating a democracy in Portugal, the coup also instigated a global wave of democratization known as the third wave um, across 60 countries. And when we think of military coups, the first images that pop into our heads are not carnations. Uh, they're not the establishment of Western democracies. Rather, the term coup d'etat, which is French for stroke of the state, conjures up really dark images of power-hungry generals uh, deposing democratically elected leaders and taking over the governments to establish an enduring military dictatorship. Coups remind us of Muammar Gaddafi. Coups remind us of Omar al-Bashir, who has reminded us of Augusta Pinochet, and scores of other ruthless military leaders who have wreaked havoc on their populations and set their national progress back by decades. Once they assume power, they stay in power. So we tend to believe that all coups fit this uh, pattern. They look the same, they smell the same, they present the same threats to democratic development. In this book, I challenge that consensus on military coups. And distilled to a score, the argument is simple. Sometimes a democracy is established through a military coup. A democratic coup, as I define it, happens when the domestic military, or a, or a portion of the domestic military, turns its arms against a dictatorship, topples a dictatorship, temporarily takes control of the government, and then transitions the country to democracy. Now, of course, a coup itself is an undemocratic event, right? Because the military comes to power in a coup by force or the threat of force. So uh, I'm using the word democratic to refer to the regime type that follows the coup, which is a democratic form of, of government. I'm also not talking about foreign interventions here. So the cases that I study are limited solely to the domestic military turning their arms against the, the dictatorship, often in response to popular protests. So a coup like this is often preceded by massive popular protests against an authoritarian government. The military response to those protests takes charge and then um, a few years later usually, at the end of the transition period, they turn over power to democratically elected leaders. Now in many ways, I'm an odd person to write a book uh, that considers coups with democratic potential. I was born in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, at a time when the country was under military rule. In 1980, which is the year before my birth, the Turkish military staged a coup, a very brutal, repressive coup, uh, and the consequences of that coup reverberated for decades to come. The coup makers disbanded the parliament, drafted a repressive constitution, committed numerous human rights abuses. They jailed people without due process, they tortured them, they executed numerous dissidents. So having personally witnessed those events, not the events themselves because I was only one, but at least the consequences of those events, I was for the majority of my life quick to condemn all military coups. But I'm also a scientist by training, uh, as Ed mentioned, and so scientists try to prove themselves wrong. Um, and in December 2010, as I was sitting in my apartment, I was then living in Chicago and watching the Arab Spring unfold, the Tunisian military, the chief of the general staff, at least by some accounts, was the person who pushed Ben Ali out of power and sent him to exile in Saudi Arabia. Just uh, two months later, the Egyptian military toppled the Hosni Mubarak government. I started to think, what if I'm wrong? And I created a falsifiable hypothesis. So meaning that the falsifiable hypothesis, which is the belief I had all of my life, all military coups are bad for democracy. And if I could find counterexamples that disprove that hypothesis, I would be proven wrong. And so as I began to think, my mind drifted to an earlier coup in Turkey, one that my grandparents had lived through. Uh, this was a coup of a much different caliber. It happened in 1960. There's a photo of that. The Turkish military toppled a dictatorship and turned power over to democratically elected leaders. And under the military supervision, the Turkish uh, society emerged from a, an 18-month transition process as a multi-party functioning uh, democracy with a thriving civil society and what's widely accepted as the, the most progressive constitution in Turkish history. 
So I began researching whether there are other coups that fit this paradoxical pattern and found numerous examples that no serious academic could dismiss as measurement errors or extreme outliers. So coups in countries as diverse as England, Mali, Colombia, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Guatemala, Turkey, Peru, Portugal, and most recently Zimbabwe, assuming that the elections go forward as planned, also toppled dictatorships and installed the foundations for um, democratic rule. So I'm going to do a number of things here. Uh, so I'm going to start first with a, a number of preliminary points or caveats about the talk, and then I'll go on to answer these questions. So why do military stage these coups? What types of military stage democratic coups? Why would militaries give up power once they assume power? And finally, what happens in the aftermath of a democratic coup? So first preliminary point is the phenomenon I describe here is the exception, not the norm. So the vast majority of military coups still continue to present impediments to democratic development and pave the way for military dictatorships. But the phenomenon I discuss in the book is also not an extreme outlier. I cover a diverse set of cases in the book from different geographies, different time periods, uh, but democratic coups are also not limited to those cases. Um, a number of empirical studies show that especially in the post-Cold War era, um, militaries tend to turn over power relatively quickly to democratically elected leaders. This is also an important preliminary point. The target of a democratic coup is an authoritarian government and the outcome is democracy. So under that definition, a coup staged against a democratically elected leader is not democratic. Many coups are perpetrated for that purpose. So to get rid of what the military leaders view as inefficient, short-sighted or corrupt politicians. So that pattern has been pretty common in Pakistan, for example. Um, and those coups don't fit within this framework I set up in the book because there is another avenue, shorter military intervention of getting rid of these politicians, which is to vote them out of office. So a military coup in my view is an extreme measure reserved for extreme cases where the incumbent politicians don't permit competitive elections. I first coined the term democratic coup d'etat in a 2012 article, um, and when a coup toppled, this is Egyptian president, former Egyptian president Mohamed Morsi, in 2013, I was inundated with questions from journalists and, and others about whether or not this coup was democratic within the way I defined it. Others jumped to their own conclusions. Um, this is Turkish president Erdogan, Shortly after the coup against Morsi, he lashed out against me in a public speech. Uh, it happened to be during my honeymoon. <laughs> I got a random text message from a friend saying, hey, did you catch the president's speech last night? Um, I said, no, uh, but I'll watch it. There is, he said, there is no such thing as a democratic coup d'etat, and he called it a figment of my imagination, comparing it to the, to the living dead. Uh, the next day, while still we're trotting through Italy, government-friendly newspapers in Turkey published pretty scathing op-eds with ad hominem attacks. Uh, one of them actually suggested that I was responsible for what had happened in Egypt because the generals had followed my framework in that article. Um, now if they did, they missed the very first step, which is that you stage a coup against, a democratic coup is staged by definition against a dictatorship. Uh, and Mohamed Morsi at the time was a democratically elected leader. He'd been elected only a year before in elections that most characterize as free and fair. Now, to be sure, Morsi was immensely unpopular and defiant. There was much to criticize about his, uh, his way of running the, the country, which routinely sidelined the opposition. But setting speculations aside, there was no indication at the time of the coup that any elections under Morsi's rule would be rigged, and so, uh, or that he wouldn't turn over power if he had lost elections. So in my view, that was not a democratic coup, which again, because the target has to be a dictatorship. Now some people uh, object to even considering the questions that I raise in the book. If we succeed in explaining how military coups may produce democracies, isn't that going to legitimize military coups? Doesn't the phrase democratic coup falsely glorify coups at the expense of other methods of regime change? Now ideally, of course, it would be enlightened civilian leaders, not military officers who oversee this transition from 
dictatorship to democracy, but sometimes the conditions for that ideal transition aren't there. Civilian leaders may be unable or unwilling to shoulder this momentous task of overthrowing a dictatorship and transitioning the country to democracy without the help of the military. The dictatorship may crush popular movements before they even take root. The press and the civil society may be malfunctioning under the oppressive might of an authoritarian government. So in some cases, in some cases, this leaves the military as the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. If other paths to democracy have been blocked by a dictatorship, the armed forces may be the only institution capable of transitioning the country away from dictatorship and installing a democracy. And the historical reality, by the way, which is why I have this uh, statement up on the slide, the historical reality is that the military plays a role in almost every single democratic transition. In many cases, that role is destructive. It's destructive in the sense that the military actually obeys regime orders to use force on the population. So you know, a prominent example of that would be the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests in China. Um, Syria might be another example of this, although factions of the Syrian military have defected uh, substantial portions have also obeyed regime demands to use force on the population. So it can be destructive. But in other cases which make up the subject of, of my book, the military may refuse orders by a dictator to use force on the population. And either let the revolution carry out its course, or they themselves step in, stage a coup, and oversee a transition process to, to democracy. So in my view, the question is not whether the military should play a role in democratic transitions because just the empirical reality is that the military almost always does. Rather, the question is, under what circumstances do military support rather than hamper democratic transitions? So I'll turn to that question next. Why do militaries stage democratic coups? Now, I've looked at so many different coups over the past seven years, and I wish I could tell you that the uh, agendas of these coup plotters tend to be altruistic, that they're putting the good of the nation ahead of themselves. I'm sure there's a subset of officers, there is a subset of officers who maintain that mentality, but they tend to be in the minority. Uh, most military officers are staging um, democratic coups because they want to get rid of a dictatorship that's not favorable to their interests. The establishment of democracy becomes merely the means through which the military achieves that intended end result. So why might the relationship between a dictatorship and the military turn south? Well, if the regime doesn't treat the military well, the military officers will have uh, reasons to reconsider their loyalty to the dictatorship. That mistreatment can come in the form of low-level, outdated military equipment, low military salaries, uh, conflicts, military conflicts uh, that don't go well and usually the officers will end up blaming um, the political leadership. And so Portugal is a good, good example of that. Before the Portuguese military toppled the Estado Nova dictatorship, Portugal had been engaged in lengthy colonial wars in Africa. And Portugal was actually one of the last colonial, uh, I'm sorry, European powers to cling to these colonial adventures in Africa and they wreaked havoc on the military. These officers were fighting these really costly, lengthy conflicts in, in Africa while the civilians sat comfortably at home. The wars isolated Portugal from the international <coughs> community and damaged its already ailing economy. And so from the military officer's perspective, staging this coup against the dictatorship was a convenient way of bringing these colonial wars, which for them was a question of life or death, to a swift end. Going back 400 years or so, or 300 years, 350 years, in England it was the religious aspirations of the Catholic King James II that turned his military against him in the 1660s. So after um, taking office, James quickly began to replace the Protestant officers with men whose sole qualification was Catholicism. And as more Protestant officers were replaced by Catholic officers, many began to question whether Catholicism would be imposed by force. And eventually these officers, with the help of William of Orange, staged a coup against King James II, 
1688 in an event known as the Glorious Revolution. And that revolution ranks as among the most significant of all political revolutions in the, the past two millennia because with that revolution, England transitioned from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. Now, I just explained how self-interest drives many of these, uh, these democratic coups, but self-interest doesn't tell the whole story. Other factors also influence outcomes. As it turns out, some types of militaries are more likely to stage democratic coups and topple a dictator as opposed to other types of militaries. We tend to, and by we I mean most academics, I think tend to speak of militaries in a very homogenous fashion. So we speak of the military or the armies as if the institution was the same across very different countries. But the military is a variable, not a constant. So asking whether militaries are naturally dangerous to democracy to me is like asking whether H2O is naturally a liquid, solid, or a gas. It depends. Militaries are much more complicated, diverse, and multidimensional than, than much of the conventional thinking on uh, civil military relations suggests. I think most people would acknowledge that you know, presidents differ from one country to the other. Legislatures in you know, South Africa and Turkey and Germany are not the same, but we tend to assume that the military is a homogenous institution that universally presents a threat to democracy. So what distinguishes militaries that help build democracies from those that destroy them? I discuss several factors in the book, but in the interest of, um, of time, I'll focus on one of them here. So the citizen-soldier model emerges as a common thread among militaries that have toppled dictatorships. Um, so citizen-soldier, that's, that's a phrase that's used in the, uh, in the literature to describe militaries that have, at least at the rank and file level, conscript soldiers. So the leadership is made up of professional officers, but at least a significant portion of the rank and file are conscripts. They serve a mandatory term in the military, usually a few years, and then they return to civilian life. So those soldiers tend to be civilians first and soldiers second. And the rotation of civilians in and out of the military creates this feedback loop between civilians and the military that keeps the military in touch with civilian values. And if you order them to turn against the people, um, just looking at what's happened on the ground, conscripts are more likely to desert or defect. Instead of, and the reason for that is, again, they identify first with um, civil society, and from their perspective, the crowds aren't just anonymous masses, they're you know, friends, neighbors, family members, etc. And instead of risking significant defections by the rank and file, the military leadership may refuse to follow regime orders to use force on the population and instead turn their arms against the dictatorship. And popular revolutions in the 21st century have tended to succeed in countries with mandatory conscription, um, and they fail usually in countries with selective conscription or purely volunteer armies. The Portuguese military is a good example of this. So in contrast to many countries where the military is isolated from, from society, Portugal's continuous colonial wars made isolation impossible. To supply the military machine from a really small population, uh, the regime instituted mandatory draft for uh, all men, a two-year service. By 1974, 1.5 million Portuguese had served in the armed forces, and one in uh, f every four adult males was in the armed forces. On top of that, too, the low pay levels of the military officers required them to take up jobs in the civilian sector. Um, and so that kept them in frequent contact with Civilians, and over time, the Portuguese military, in a very real sense, became the Portuguese society. For similar reasons, many founders of the United States were deeply skeptical about maintaining a military of just purely professional soldiers, primarily because British kings had used uh, a standing army against political opponents. And so in colonial America, citizen soldiers were called to service a couple times a year, for military review and training. They wore their daily civilian clothes as opposed to military uniforms. Um, now this represented significant problems <laughs> in terms of combat readiness and discipline and whatnot. 
But many of the founders consider this model to be, to be uh, less pernicious. And nearly a century before America, the colonies declared independence from Great Britain, these citizen soldiers were at the forefront of several coups in New York, Massachusetts, and elsewhere against autocratic governors that were appointed by the British crown. And those coups, 100, century, uh, 100 years later, paved the way for the, um, uh, the, the War of Independence. A similar scenario played itself out in 2011 when the Egyptian military deposed Hosni Mubarak. Now, the transition process in Egypt later took a turn for the worse, but in 2011, when I was in Egypt shortly after the coup happened, uh, I heard a very different story. The rank and file soldiers that had been deployed to crush this popular uprising were conscripts. And um, I was interviewing a number of the leaders of the protests and they explained to me how they erupted in celebration at the site of the first tank that moved into Tartar Square. Because the tank was shielding the protesters from attacks by the police. Um, and the soldiers were protecting the, the protesters in 2011. Um, and instead of ordering those conscripts to shoot on the protesters, which would have been a really risky and uncertain proposition, the military leaders instead uh, decided to turn their arms against the Mubarak dictatorship. By taking charge, the leaders were also able to preserve their own interests in a transition process that they themselves controlled. They had their own self-interested reasons for getting rid of Mubarak. Um, the Mubarak dictatorship is often called a military dictatorship, but I think it's a misnomer because Mubarak's Egypt was really a police state. Mubarak favored the police at the expense of the military. The military officers were not happy about this. Um, on top of that too, the next person in line to be the next pharaoh of Egypt was Jamal Mubarak, uh, who was one of Hosni Mubarak's sons, and he was known not to be friendly to the military's interests. Plus, the U.S. had withdrawn its support from Mubarak, and so all of these variables had lined up for the military to pull the rug out from under the Mubarak family. Now, there are exceptions to this pattern. Even in a conscript military, if a regime can insert differences between, significant differences between the soldiers and the intended victims of the violence, violence is more likely to result. So this is what happened on Tiananmen Square in, in 1989. China is a conscript military, so the willingness of its soldiers to use force on the population may be puzzling at first, but significant differences existed between the conscripts, conscripts that were called upon to crush this popular uprising and the protesters themselves. So the protesters were primarily students from urban areas, whereas the um, the soldiers called to put down this uprising were from rural areas. Uh, they were uneducated soldiers who had never walked through a city before. And so they found it hard to identify with the demands of the protesters. And even so, many soldiers defected, but you know, a substantial portion did crush the uprising. Um, but I do think when, when we see cases like this of a conscript military using force on the population, it's usually because the regime has managed somehow to insert differences between the protesters and the soldiers. So, so far I explained why militaries may stage coups against a dictator and what types of militaries are more likely to do so, but there is another puzzling question. Even if a military gets rid of an unpopular dictator, why would imposing generals armed with tanks and guns and all voluntarily give up power to civilians. I mean, it's one thing to say that we're gonna get rid of an unpopular dictator, but it's something else to say that we're gonna take the further step of actually establishing the foundations of democratic rule and turning power over to democratically elected leaders. In summer 2002, um, Secretary of State Colin Power, Powell invoke the pottery barn rule. If you break it, you buy it, or you own it, to explain to President George W. Bush the possible consequences of invading Iraq. You're going to be the proud owner of 25 million people, he warned the president. You're going to own their hopes, their aspirations, their problems. You're gonna own it all. Now, Powell's 
Powdery Barn rule turned out to be a misnomer because the store quickly rushed to announce that they cover accidental damage <laughs> to their <laughs> on-display products, so you don't have to buy it. But the sentiment underlying the rule is undoubtedly correct. The rule refers to the simple idea that when you take down a regime, you bring down a government, you become the government. And that rule applies to military coups as well. Once the military overthrows the government, it becomes the government. The military takes charge, uh, a group of officers called the, the junta. Now, many military le leaders have no desire to be in government, right? They want to return to their core competency, which is to run the military. Not only that, but after toppling a dictator, the military often inherits a complete and utter mess. When a dictator is toppled, usually significant amounts of economic and social turmoil result. And for several reasons, prolonged participation in politics can hurt the military officers and the military as an institution, prompting an exit from politics. Even military officers that were initially hell-bent on a prolonged military dictatorship may lose their appetite for governance after they realize just the, the human and political capital that's required to establish an enduring dictatorship. The other thing that happens is, you know, a coup brings together officers of different, different ideologies. The one thing that they agree on is to topple the dictator, right? That's the unifying goal. But once that unifying mission is accomplished, all of these rifts begin to emerge within the, the ruling junta. That was the case after the 1974 coup in Portugal. The military officers agreed on toppling the Estado Novo dictatorship, but once that unifying goal was accomplished, they disagreed vehemently on the future direction of the country, on the economy, on decolonization. All of these central questions paralyzed the military leadership, and so quitting from politics Turning over power to civilian leaders was the best way to retreat while saving face. And for many coup makers, life goes on after democracy is established. And in fact, a transition to democracy could actually be quite lucrative for, for military leaders because it allows them to deploy what I call golden parachutes. This is a term. Uh, from the corporate context, but in the book I talk about how militaries often receive exit benefits as a result of leaving power and turning power over to democratically elected leaders. So the military might, for example, obtain a veto power over certain regulations related to the military. They can find their budget increase. They can find their salaries increased. And so the coup makers may deploy their golden parachutes exit from a troubled leadership position in government and turn power over to democratically elected leaders. The final part of my talk is about what happens after the military exits politics and turns over power to democratically elected leaders. In many cases, the new democracy can eventually blossom into a, a genuine liberal democracy, but in some case, cases, things may not go as well. A coup is like chemotherapy. It's an extreme measure reserved for extreme cases. It can be highly effective in curing an authoritarian patient, but it can also generate significant side effects, at least in the short term. The coup may produce only a fragile democracy teetering on the brink of collapse. Democratic institutions may not fully mature, and the military may roar back to life after only a superficial exit from politics. This is former Turkish president and prime minister Süleyman Demirel. In the late 1990s, he was asked to comment on an ongoing power struggle in Turkey between the civilian and the military leadership, and he replied with a joke. He said there was an experiment in an English zoo to see if wolves and lambs could live together in the same cage. The zoo director was asked if the experiment was working, and the director replied, yeah, it's working, but from time to time, we have to replace the lambs. <laughs> so that response identifies a, a major predicament with coups, which is that all coups can beget future coups. So after toppling one leader with a coup, the military can realize that, well, they can do the same again with a different leader. So it can awaken the wolves, the military. It can also awaken the lambs. 
a coup can create a societal culture shift with coups becoming an acceptable way of doing business and dealing with deficiencies in the democratic process. The politicians may grow dependent on the military as a quick fix to solve all of their problems rather than using the mechanisms of democratic politics. Are the incumbent politicians causing you problems? Call your allies in the military. Is there violence in the streets? Ask the military to step in. And of course, the military is not the cure to all of life's problems. Even if the military can solve the civilian's problems quickly and efficiently, over-reliance on the military can hinder rather than help democratic progress over time. In other words, if the military is the all-purpose antibiotic for all of the civilian's problems, the civilians may never develop the immunity to fight pathogens, political pathogens, on their own. And Egypt, I think, is a good example of this. In Egypt, the same mechanism, a coup, that was used to get rid of a dictator in 2011 was then used against the democratically elected Mohamed Morsi in 2013. And instead of developing the hard work that's involved in a democracy, building popular appeal, campaigning, trying to get rid of Morsi at the ballot box, the opposition relied on the military to do their work for them. And the military's preemptive quick fix uh, short-circuited the established democratic procedures in Egypt and significantly jeopardized the future of Egypt's democracy. The same thing happened in Turkey in summer 2016. Um, on Friday, July 15th, hundreds of military officers began to execute what turned out to be an ill-fated coup attempt. So this is Erdogan, President Erdogan, appearing by FaceTime from his resort where he was vacationing. Somewhat ironic for a president who's long sought to censor the internet, uh, but I'll put that aside for now. So he joins us this live uh, TV conference or TV show by, uh, by FaceTime and called on his supporters to take on the streets, to take to the streets to resist the, the military. The coup failed with remarkable speed. And as far as coups go, the July 15th attempt, I think will go down uh, in history as one of the uh, most unwise and incompetent coup attempts in history uh, for a number of reasons. First, the coup doesn't fit the democratic coup paradigm I talk about in the book. Um, at the time, the, Erdogan's government, the Erdogan government was not authoritarian. But the coup plotters would all, on top of that, the coup plotters would fail coup making 101. Um, and the whole point of a coup against an executive is to find the executive, restrain him. They didn't even know where Erdogan was, even though the location of his resort was widely publicized in the press a few days before the coup attempt happened. Um, the plotters also severely miscalculated the effort required to bring down a stable, popular government. I mean, coups are always risky, but coups against popular leaders are a fool's errand. It would have taken nothing short of a civil war to bring down Erdogan from, from his seat. And what's more, having failed at their costly venture, they emboldened the very man that they set out to destroy. Erdogan is a firm believer in the adage, which I think comes from Winston Churchill, that a, a good crisis should never go to waste. So he sees on this coup attempt against his rule to institute a state of emergency, which continues to this day, and, and crack down on his political opponents. Many of my academic colleagues in Turkey were fired from their jobs, detained, arrested. Uh, it's too dangerous for me to go home. Uh, it's been now two years, because I know I'm on the government's radar screen. My name popped up in emails that have been hacked from the government and leaked to WikiLeaks and, and all this stuff. So, so it's a disaster, and I think it all began or the, the excuse, not unlike the Reichstag fire, uh, the excuse for that crackdown emerged with this ill-fated coup attempt um, in 2016. So I'll briefly wrap up on, on this note, which is, so what sets apart, or on this question, uh, what sets apart the countries that successfully set up a robust democracy following a democratic coup from those that don't? In my view, balanced civil-military relations following these coups emerged from synergy. 
So the word synergy is based on the Greek word synergia, which means working together. And in this case, synergy means the civilians setting aside their ideological differences and constructing a stable democracy, a viable alternative to military rule. Because if the civilians themselves are divided on the future of the country, on the military's exit from politics, the military might more easily exploit those divisions to its, its benefit. So what Aristotle said about how power abhors a vacuum um, equally applies in this context as well. If the civilians are successful in constructing stable, densely, uh, densely constructed authority, then there won't be power vacuums for the military to, uh, to fill. And a great example of this is, is Colombia. Um, after the military staged a democratic coup against the Colombian dictator Rojas, who's pictured here in 1957, they all agreed. Aside, it, you know, Setting aside their ideological differences, they all agreed that one, no party would be excluded from civilian politics, but that two, the military would exit politics. So there were no politicians conspiring with the military. There was no one contemplating in the civilian uh, political sphere of a prolonged military government. So they presented a united front against the military, and on top of that, very strategically, they managed to walk the military back to the barracks with the military's dignity intact. The military was actually associated with some of the excesses of this, of the Rojas dictatorship, but instead of pointing any fingers at the military, the civilians constructed an alternative narrative for public consumption. They said that it was the presidential family and a few corrupt civilians, not military leaders, that were responsible for the excesses of the Rojas dictatorship, and that alternative narrative, the military leaders found much easier to swallow and they ended up exiting from, from politics. So despite their side effects, the objectives that these democratic coups accomplish, overthrowing a dictator and establishing the foundations of democracy, I think is nothing short of, of monumental. It was the military in ancient Greece that stood up to the dictatorship of the 400 that threatened to end democracy in the state that actually coined the term democracy. There was a military in England with the help of William of Orange that toppled uh, King James II and transitioned the country from absolute to constitutional monarchy. And it was coups staged by citizen soldier militias in the colonies that toppled autocratic governors and paved the way for the establishment of the modern United States. So I'll stop there um, and I'd love to take your questions. Okay. So we have about 15 minutes for questions, and the microphone's here, here, and there. Oh, am I supposed to call on people? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yes. Great. Uh, I'm uh, John Michael Arnold. I'm a PhD student at Princeton. Um, so given, given your argument, any authoritarian government that ends up with a conscript military and doesn't find some way to also protect itself against a democratic coup is taking a risk. Um, so can you say a bit more about, of the cases you've looked at, why do these authoritarian governments end up with citizen militaries but don't find a way to coup-proof themselves? Uh, yeah. Is it kind of, is, is the Portugal example sort of what's happened in the other cases whereby a regime needs manpower to fight a war and so it ends up with a conscript military? Uh, uh, and if, if that's the general case, why don't they find some way to, uh, you know, create divisions between the conscripts and the rest of society? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, and so, uh, two answers. One is that not all authoritarian governments are rational. Uh, so I think they might be operating under a self-delusion that even with a citizen-soldier military that their rule is safe. Uh, so that's one answer, and I know it's not fully satisfactory, so I've got a second one. The second one is that the Authoritarian government um, does try to coup-proof the military, but it doesn't work. Now, it may not work because, as you said, manpower is necessary for, to maintain a, a military, um, and so they need to, to enlist people in, in, in service. Second, usually the way that most leaders go about trying to coup-proof the, uh, the military is from the top down. So, I think this is what Maduro is trying to do in Venezuela as well, and it's worked um, up until now at least. Same thing with, with Bashar Assad in Syria. So they, 
try to make the senior officers, um, to try to mold the senior officers so that the senior officers would be on the same page as the authoritarian government. And so Assad, for example, recruited um, officers from his own, uh, own religious sect, Alawites, to serve um, at the senior levels. Now that doesn't change the fact, of course, that the rank and file are still conscripts. And so I think doing that might help to some extent, but it's not going to prevent an uprising like the ones we saw in, in Portugal where the, the rank and file are still loyal to the populace as opposed to the authoritarian government. Yes. Sir, Midshipman First Class Artem Sherbinin. So this is a bit of a civ mill question here, but uh, t in today's world where we're seeing a lot of uh, states uh, backslide democratically, I'm referring to the democratic deconsolidation phenomenon. Right. Um, do you think there's any situation which a democratic military incurs an obligation to actually launch a coup? So more specifically, uh, as officers, we and a lot of, uh, in a lot of Western liberal democracies, we swear an oath to the Constitution, right. not to any particular leader. So in a state in which we see backsliding and a reversal of liberal principles, is there an obligation for the military to step in? Great question. Thank you. So I think a military coup, even in cases of democratic erosion or deconsolidation, has to be a means of last resort, meaning that you have to exhaust all other alternatives. And so I make a point in the book that, for example, I exclude from my definition of authoritarian regimes, competitive authoritarian regimes. So countries that are sort of, if you conceptualize democracy and authoritarianism along a spectrum, they lie somewhere in the middle, um, sort of sliding towards authoritarianism, but they're not quite there. And I specifically exclude those cases because even in those countries, as hard as it might be, there is still an avenue short of a military coup to get rid of the politicians in power. So I think the obligation only arises, um, or at least in the cases that I looked at, the coup happens after all available alternatives are, are exhausted. The civilians have tried and failed to get rid of an entrenched dictatorship. They're out on the streets, they're protesting in massive numbers, and then the regime orders the military to shoot on them. That's usually the setup, and then the military says, we're not gonna do that, and we'll turn our arms against the dictatorship instead. Um, yes. <clears throat> Previous one. Sure. Uh, there's an alternative narrative about the Morsi situation, yep. and that is that uh, Morsi and his party were acting in ways which cumulatively were going to lock in right. the dominance of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and make it basically a one-party system, That's right. uh, possibly in a position then to undermine the Constitution. So uh, it raises the question of whether there can be a kind of preemptive uh, yep. democratic coup. I think this is what, what was being suggested, and. Uh, of, of course, we know that you know preventive uh, arguments, uh, preventive justifications for violence are very problematic because right. they're highly speculative, they're subject to abuse, et cetera. But uh, you could imagine that if you thought that uh, the way the regime was going, it was going to make peaceful avenues of change increasingly difficult and that it was definitely going in a, an unconstitutional democratic direction, it looks like at least prima facie there could be an argument for a democratic coup before you actually get to having a, a, a clearly authoritarian regime. Right. Yeah, this is a question that I struggled with uh, quite a bit as I was writing the book. What to do with, with the scenario that you described where the writing is on the wall that this person is headed in an authoritarian direction and do we just let them get there or do we do something beforehand? And I resolved in favor of not including these preemptive coups in my definition, largely for the reasons that I mentioned in the talk. I mean, these coups do come with side effects. And so to the extent that they do, then we wanna be very careful about delineating the circumstances under which they're acceptable. And so once you open the door to preemptive coups, then the argument for a coup becomes much easier to make, right? Because now we're in the realm, as you said, of speculation about what may or may not happen. And so exceptions can easily begin to multiply. And I wanted to, to guard against that, which is why I excluded preemptive coups from, from my definition.
in addition to the focus on preemptive coups and your decision not to do that, uh, you focus on democracy rather than liberalism, individual, mm -hmm. individual rights, tolerance, right. et cetera. And it seems like the motivating factor for both the Turkish military going all the way back to Ataturk and the Young Turks and to the Egyptian military recently was more about liberalism than it was about democracy. And in the Middle East, that's so this might be particularly the Middle East, it seems like that yeah. tension between liberalism and democracy is more pronounced. If that's the motivating normative factor for the military to conduct those coups, then why don't you include that, even, said, even considering the fact that preemptive coups might be justified on those grounds? Yeah, good question. Um, so I'm not sure I agree that the Turkish military, even the Egyptian military, have a, a deep-seated commitment to, to liberalism. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, for example, in the Egyptian case, the military stood by Mubarak's side for three decades, right? And so if they had this overarching commitment to liberalism, divorced from their own self-interests, you would have thought that they would have acted sooner. Right? Instead of waiting until 2011, in other words, if the primary driver is the promotion of liberal democracy, individual rights, and so on and so forth, then why did the Egyptian military wait from what, 1981 till 2011 to do something? Um, and I think the same is true for the, for the Turkish military. Like the statements that the military issues whenever they have taken over the government is always justified by a commitment to liberalism. Um, that's right. But if you dig a little deeper, there's always something else going on that motivated the military officers to act. Um, and the reason I picked free and fair elections as this, or the metric, uh, or the barometer for measuring whether a coup is democratic is, is all democracies begin there. Like that's a very minimalist conception of democracy. Once you overthrow a dictator, you're probably not gonna have a liberal democracy overnight. It's gonna develop over time. And so if the question was related to the definition of democracy and why I picked free and fair elections of the metric as opposed to a more robust form of democracy is because almost all democracies first begin as you know, a very minimalist procedural democracy and then they mature over time. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Jim, first class Sims. Um, I was wondering what are the role of international uh, multilateral values-based alliances? Uh, I know Portugal, in Turkey were members of NATO. Uh, how does that factor into the success of a coup being democratic? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually one of the chapters in the book, uh, one of the factors that set apart the militaries that, um, that topple dictatorships and, and set up democracies is connection to international alliances. So as you said, the, the officers who staged the coup in Portugal were all NATO officers. Um, the same thing in, in Turkey. In, in when the, the, the Turkish military staged the coup in 1960, almost all of those officers had served overseas, had been trained overseas, uh, had been exposed to democratic values. And actually, if you read the interviews with some of the Portuguese officers that, that staged the coup in 1974, they're very, very express about the role that those relationships played for them. I mean, they, they say something like, now we realized how backward our society was because of our engagements with um, other um, other countries in, in in military alliances like like NATO. So, so I think on balance it's, it's helpful. Although there are times where it can hurt, of course, too, in the sense that you know, there are numerous examples of coups engineered by foreign governments, including the United States, to topple what they view as unfriendly. Uh, regimes, like the Allende regime in Chile, for example, and then setting up um, a different government that turns out to be dictatorial. So it can be a, a double-edged sword, but I, I do think alliances like NATO are, are really helpful in nudging these militaries in a, in a democratic direction. Okay. All right. Right on time. Thank you. Yeah. And um, yeah, this, uh, I, I think this is a really important work because we were talking yesterday at length about the, the high cost of revolutions and the proportionality problem associated with these transitions. And here you have a, a more, I think, a more bloodless means. Uh, many coups can, can get pretty ugly, but 
know, many of them uh, are not. And so I think our policy, knowing this, and through, because of your work, I think our policy might shift a little bit toward being a little more sympathetic toward coups, democratic coups especially. And I think the midshipmen in this room who have mill-mill contacts that they develop over their careers, because of that policy change, might find themselves brought in as intermediaries to work with uh, their military friends in these countries. So I think that uh, your work is extremely important, and we thank you for coming and talking about it.